Welcome, I'm glad for the big turnout. It helps when there's no competition. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, let me, just as a matter so you're not on the edge of your seats and, and I disappoint you, I know some of you have seen my online talks about private military defense and like police and judicial uh, activities. I'm not gonna cover that in this talk. That's what's called the market for security. So I do that one on, on Friday. So this one is other, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of hodgepodge of various issues of, you know, how could things be handled in a free society? I also wanna make just a quick announcement. Some of you may be interested to know. So I think a lot of you have noticed my son's been down playing chess and he played a faculty member here. I'm not gonna say who it is, but let me give you a hint. By the transitive property, <laughs> I can now beat Friedrich Hayek in chess. So you can figure out, so we, we've narrowed it down. All right, so. So economics of a stateless society. So for one thing is why, did we, why do I use that term stateless? Uh, there's a thing going back where um, some people make a distinction between the state and government and like state with a capital S and government with a small g. And I used to think, oh, who cares about that? But more, more recently, I've had a change of heart, so I try to, you know, sometimes you, sw you slip up in casual conversation, but I do try to stress the state, because some people, the way they use government, they mean it just as a more general, like there's authority, so they might say, oh, there's government within the church or the family, any sort of hierarchy at all, even if it's consented to in, in some manner, so that's why I'm trying in this talk to uh, stick to, I'll be saying stateless. Also, just so you're not getting confused, Really, what the, what the goal is from a Rothbardian perspective and the, what motivates the people who would, are you know, the faculty at this uh, event is a, is a free society. I think that's the, the more positive goal. So statelessness is necessary but insufficient for a free society, right? So that obviously Martians come and blow up the world or something, it would be stateless, but, you know, we'd say, uh, it's, I'm not sure what, you know, they'd get rid of the NSA. So it's, it's uh, I'm not sure. It's a toss-up. All right, so that's, that's where we're coming from with this one. Let me motivate this by giving uh, a very interesting quote here. So this is from an intellectual, I'll tell you who it is in a second, but let's just consider the statement. For if the bulk of the public were really convinced of the illegitimacy of the state, if it were convinced that the state is nothing more nor less than a bandit gang writ large, then the state would soon collapse to take on no more status or breadth of existence than another mafia gang. Hence the necessity of the state's employment of ideologists, and hence the necessity of the state's age-old alliance with the court intellectuals who weave the apology for state rule. And so I, I like this quote because it underscores, I think even libertarians sometimes fall prey to this misconception that the reason the, the state has so much power and influence in society is that they have more guns than people, or geez, they, you know, they just have tanks and we don't, and so therefore that's why they're in charge. And that's not really correct, that Mises, uh, relying on the, on the insights of David Hume would often stress that in the long run there's no such thing as an unpopular government. Okay, even in, you might say, oh come on, maybe like in Western democracies, but, but you know, what about authoritarian regimes? No, you can see this principle there the most clearly. It's precisely in the most totalitarian regimes where they have the strongest, tightest control on the media, the schools, um, you know, people don't have internet access, right? So if it really were you know, the North Korean government were in charge, this is the government, the North Korean state were in charge because of the fact that they could just kill people and that, you know, any dissent wouldn't be tolerated, then they would say, yeah, go ahead, teach whatever you want in the schools, because if anyone steps out of line, you know, we'll kill them. That's not what they do, though. They very tightly control what ideas the people have because they know how fragile their rule really is. I said, the people running the show, they, they know just how fragile it is. That's why they have to worry about public opinion. That's why they have to have this whole system of intellectuals, court intellectuals, who propagate falsehoods and you know, myths about, when, like when you think about U.S. history, the normal way that's taught is just a succession of U.S. presidents, right? As, as opposed to, ah, then this was the age when this entrepreneur you know, did his thing or this inventor did such and such. Whereas, you know, it's supposed to be this, this period of different rules by the person in the White House. That's the way it's typically taught, and it's not a coincidence, okay? So, so that's the importance of a week like Mises University, that yes, there's other particular strategies like seasteading and the Free State Project or political action, whether to educate the public or just to, you know, try to elect more libertarian officials. But all these uh, going uh, underground, off the grid, so forth, but all those things require 
more of the public to agree with the spirit, at least, of the stuff we're teaching this week, right? Like, even if, for example, drugs were still uh, illegal, if nobody in your neighborhood was ever going to call the cops on you, then it wouldn't really matter, right? You see, so it takes, the public has to cooperate with the authorities, and ultimately, as Mises says, it's not enough for the, the ruler to have an army because why do the soldiers point their guns at the population instead of turning around and pointing them at the ruler? And you know, coups happen, there are violent overthrows of the government, and so Mises' point was ultimately it's ideas that matter. So who was the, this might surprise you, who actually wrote this, this uh, really provocative passage? It was a young Janet Yellen in grad school. No, it wasn't. <laughs> It was Murray Rothbard. <laughs> now, now, why did I do that? I just told you not to trust the court intellectuals. Because I'm here with a tie doesn't mean what I'm saying is right, okay? <laughs> trust no one. All right. There, apparently, there, it's probably apocryphal, but I, the, I was reading on like the Sicilian you know, mafia and where all that stuff came from, and apparently there's a, a story about how the, the mafia Don takes his young, you know, his oldest son, but when he's still a young kid, takes him out, like, and has him stand up on some building that's, you know, like maybe this tall, and says, jump off, I'll catch you. And the kid's like, no, daddy, I don't want to. He's like, come on, come on, I'll catch, I'll catch you. The kid jumps, and he just lets him smack into the ground. He goes, trust no one. All right, so. <laughs> All right. So here's, uh, I'm going to jump into a bunch of specifics, but there's a general presumption for volunteerism. So no matter what the issue is, it's odd that normally the way the argument goes for, oh, in, yeah, yeah, sure, freedom works for things like TVs and ice cream cones, but in this particular issue, and the, the interventionist will give some particular social uh, situation, we need state intervention because of da 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 right? And they'll, they'll go through and list why standard profit-maximizing business wouldn't be applicable in that situation. But what's odd is it's like everybody in the world can understand there's this glaring gap here where people want something to be done, and yet the only people who seem to not be able to recognize that are the profit-seeking business people, right? And so the idea is that's silly. Yeah, it might take some ingenuity. There might have to be some cleverness in how can we charge and make money solving this genuine problem that we all agree people have here but it's odd that the one set of people who see, apparently can't recognize that are the people who would make a bunch of money from fixing the problem. So this is a, probably a bit dated. My, the principle is the vanilla ice. Uh, I know like two of you now know who this is um, because his iconic song, he has a line, if there's a problem, yo, I'll solve it. And so, okay, I will have to get a different reference for next year. All right. So let's talk about money. So here's an area where a lot of people just assume, oh, of course you need the state to provide money, right? They can't even conceive, I mean, just look around, look at, there's money that's just provided by states all over the world, so of course that has to happen. But as Menger taught that, no, actually, historically, money emerged first voluntarily in the private sector, and it was only later that political states coerced and uh, you know, took over that area. So how did that, how did that form? So just talk about something like gold. So Menger, and I'm here, I, I think you guys may have gotten a version of this already, but let me just reiterate the story really quickly, not just for its own sake, but also to show the type of explanation in something that you could call a spontaneous order. So first of all, Menger, and by the way, let me just mention, this isn't just that Austrian fanboys are saying, oh, we like the way Menger handled this. No, back in the day, I think it was like in the Encyclopedia of Economics, Menger had the article entry on the origin of money. Okay, so it was... He was acknowledged at the time, in the late 1800s, as he was one of the people who really had written the best exposition of how could money have emerged spontaneously, if that's the word you want to use, or, or without you know, some central planning organization or some wise king. So for what, one thing, as Menger pointed out, the problem with the so-called state theory of money, right? the idea that, look, if there's this thing, money, it's clearly not natural, right? Like we, in other words, we, we say, where, where did trees come from? Well, that's obviously something that was, was natural. You can talk about evolution, or you can talk about God, but it's not that humans had anything to do with why trees are there, but money is clearly something that came from human beings. And so then the, it's a natural, uh, and it's also very useful, and so it's a natural inclination for people to say, so therefore there must have been some wise person or group of rulers way back when who invented this thing, because they can't conceive of how else could it have arisen. And so Menger pointed out, there's a lot of problems with that. So number one, we don't have any evidence of that, right? You would think if somebody invented money, we might remember that person. It might have been recorded you know, somehow. 
and that that's, that's not the case. He says, also, even if it were the, true that some, you know, so people are engaging in barter, let's say, and then some uh, wise person has this great idea, like, you know what, what if instead of trading things that you directly value and accept and trade, what if we, and he like picks up a stone and says, what if every, one half of every transaction involves people accepting these stones that are by themselves not something that you would value? That would sound really stupid, right? I mean, we now, having grown up in this world, we understand that actually that does make sense, but you can see how back then that would, that would seem crazy. And then furthermore, even if he, like maybe the, the king says, all right, everybody has to, when you're selling something, you got to accept these stones first. And don't worry, when you want to buy something, you trade in these stones for it. So that's why it'll all be a wash in the long run and we'll all be more effective and efficient. Even if he could convince his subjects to go along with that, perhaps you know, because he's threatening them somehow, what would be the purchasing power, right? So if originally you were going to sell horses for so many eggs, now you're saying, oh, gee, I have to first sell the horses for stones. Well, to know how many stones to accept, you need to know, well, how many stones trade for eggs to know if this is still a good deal or not, or maybe I just don't want to sell. Well, how would you know that? Because the egg seller is in the same boat. How does he know how many eggs to sell for stones, right? So you see, it's, it's hard, and this is another area where I think even when we talk about fiat money, even a lot of Austrians and libertarians sometimes say, oh, the reason this is val is because the government has guns and makes it valuable, and it has to be more complicated than that, right? Because you, you wouldn't know just from scratch what's the purchasing power of even this fiat money supposed to be. So just, just keep that in mind, that there's a lot more involved when to get people to accept and use something as money. Okay, so that's great, and it seems like Megger makes some good points, but then how... How did we get there? It's almost like he seems to have proven, yeah, money can't exist. How would it ever get off the ground? And so the story he tells is, I'm obviously simplifying it here, uh, boiling it down for the, just the basic story, is that even in a state of, I'll say barter, the, the more technical term would be du direct exchange, but even in that state, some goods would have a bigger market than others. Some things would be more saleable, or we could say more marketable, so things like eggs and, and beef and so forth would have a, a wide market where something like a very uh, sophisticated telescope, it could be valuable, but only a very few people would want to buy that thing, right? And so if you're going into town to trade and you're carrying a bunch of eggs, you're going to quickly find somebody on the other side of that, you know, who wants eggs and has whatever you want. But if you're going to town with a really sophisticated telescope and you want horses, what are the chances you're going to find someone on that day who's selling horses and wants a really sophisticated telescope? So you see, you see the problem there. So Manger said what people would do who are in the position of wanting to unload goods that are relatively unmarketable, even though they might be very valuable, is they would do indirect trades, right? They would take something as a stepping stone. So if they found someone selling eggs who wanted a really fancy telescope, they might trade because they know if I have a bunch of eggs, I'm much more likely to find someone selling horses who wants eggs than wants this sophisticated telescope. So that's the, the first link there in the argument. And once you accept that, which you know, seems pretty straightforward, it snowballs, right? So then what happens is things that initially, just because of their attributes and people, their desire for direct consumption or production, desired a certain good and it was relatively marketable, now its marketability gets enhanced because there's a second layer of people who accept it because they're going to trade it away, right? And so things that initially were a little bit more marketable now are a lot more marketable because more and more people accept them in a trade just intending to hold them temporarily to unload them later, all right? And that process snowballs, and if one or two goods gets to the point at which just about everybody realizes, oh, yeah, I'm not going to have trouble unloading that, so I'll, whatever I have to sell, I'll sell, take that thing, and then go trade it away for whatever I, I ultimately desire, We'll go, oh, that's money. That's what money is. It's a medium of exchange that's universally accepted. So, um, and then the things like why gold and silver, there it's because if you think about what sorts of goods would be very useful in that role, things that are, you know, very durable, like, like cattle could, could work in some respects, but it's, you know, you have to feed them, they go to the bathroom, there's all sorts of problems with them. If you want to buy something that costs half of a cow, it's hard to make change. Right? So there's things like that, whereas gold and silver, there's really nothing wrong with them. They're pretty good on all the dimensions of what would make a good medium of exchange. And that's why, over time, the market embraced gold and silver as the monies. Whereas something you might have thought, like, what about diamonds? 
The, the strike against diamonds is they're not homogeneous, right? It's not that a pound of diamonds is a pound of diamonds. If you have one huge diamond, that's more valuable than a bunch of smaller diamonds that have the same weight. Whereas with gold, it doesn't work like that because you can just melt gold down and it's a pound of gold or an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. Okay, so that's Menger's story about how money could have emerged just using, and, and notice there, nobody planned that outcome. So, and this is a subtlety. So it's not that we're saying rationality wasn't involved and this was just, oh, just money emerged and it was kind of this weird thing. Everybody was making very specific means, ends, appraisements but what they were doing was just saying, okay, I want, you know, I have this telescope, I want to get, um, I'm going to say horses, and there's a guy here offering eggs for a telescope, I will make this trade because I know I'm more likely, right, so that's a very rational thing to do there, it's not, we're not just appealing to some tendency or propensity to trade, you can see why that person's improving his own position, the way he evaluates it, but he wasn't thinking, ah, and then when others start doing this, 10 years from now, we're all going to be using money, and that makes more sense than barter. Nobody was thinking like that. It just sort of naturally happened, each person looking, you know, fairly short term, where this result was something that was the result of human action, but not of human design. Okay, what about coins? Okay, so you could say, all right, that, that explains maybe why gold could be the money in a community, but what about actually having coinage? That's something that states around the world right now do. But again, this was originally you had private mints that would take the gold and silver and stamp them into coins. And it was only later that you know, states, political institutions crowded that out and took over that, that function. So that this isn't just science fiction. George Selgin actually has a book on this going through and, and, and showing pictures too. So it's not only that the money, the coins that were privately produced were possible, that they existed, they were actually much better looking coins than the stuff that the states produced, because they had to be, there wasn't competition. So to be clear, the private mints, they didn't make gold money. Gold was money by itself. All they were doing was they, 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 it would be a, a matter of convenience to, for example, if a merchant was selling something for 10 ounces of gold and you walked in there with just a block of yellow metal, they, could, you know, they would have to weigh it, they would have to try to assess its purity, whereas if there was a company that would take the actual blocks of metal and stamp them into very recognizable coins with a certain insignia that would be hard for counterfeiters to match, and on the, you know, the circumference, they had ridges, so it'd be hard to shave off um, you know, bits of gold so that you were assured of the, the fineness and weight of it. That's what the mint did. That's the service it provided. It was just certification that this really is an ounce of gold, or you can tell this is an ounce with very little inspection compared to just the, the raw metal, as it were. Okay, and so that really happened. So since mints were competing with each other, that's why the coins would have to look nice. That was one of the attributes. Why would you carry coins from this mint versus another? Well, if the things were really ornamental and pretty to look at, that would give them a slight edge. And of course, they also had to be hard to counterfeit and so forth. All right, what about banking? That's another area where it seems like, oh, clearly you need to have heavy regulation at least of banking because otherwise the public's going to be taken advantage of. No, again here, this is standard. You can see how this would emerge. It's very inconvenient to just rely on gold coins. And so there would be a role for banks to issue notes, for example, saying the bearer of this is entitled to one ounce of gold at the Murphy Bank or at the you know, Rothbard Bank or whatever, and they could be 100% reserve. I won't get into that because I you know, did the lecture yesterday. And I'm saying even this service, that, that is providing a genuine service to the public, right? If you get to be pretty wealthy and you have thousands of gold coins in your possession, you're vulnerable to robbery, right? And so you could go get a storm at this place that has a big vaults and armed guards and cameras and insurance, and then they give you a, you know, a debit card in modern times or back then they could give you paper notes, which are very easy to transport. If you're going to make a large purchase, it's a lot easier to hand over some high denomination notes than to have bags of gold coins, or you could write checks, you know, that the bank could certify that, yes, this person has, whatever, 10,000 ounces of gold to his name, and so he can write these authorized checks, and there can be a very, you know, they can check your signature and blah, blah, blah to make sure it's a legitimate transaction, right? So there's plenty of uh, reasons that banks would emerge and did emerge historically for through the voluntary market. Let me just mention here that what we're told that regulation and central banks are supposed to do is the opposite of actually what they do in practice, right? So the, the claim is, oh, without heavy regulation, if you just had laissez-faire in banking, 
banks would be issuing these notes. The public would have no idea what they were. There'd be fly-by-night companies, and you know, merchants would be accepting notes, and then they'd go and the bank wouldn't exist anymore, things like that. And so we need regulation to protect the public from wild inflationary uh, booms caused by these wildcat banks. And actually, that is 100% backwards. That in the voluntary private sector, where there's just standard contract enforcement, where banks don't have special privileges, there would be very sharp limits on note issue. Because if any one bank issued more notes than its competitors did, its reserves of gold would qu quickly get drained, right? That, because it, you would, you are a merchant, you're accepting, let's say you accept notes from anybody, what are you gonna do with them? You're not gonna hold notes from some bank you don't recognize, you're gonna go to your bank and deposit them, and so at the end of every week or month, the banks all settle up with each other with clearing transactions, and on net, if your customers turned in more notes than this bank's customers did vis-a-vis -vis each other, the one bank settles up by sending net gold to the other bank to, to get settled up. And so if one bank is issuing paper notes like crazy and doesn't have the gold to back it up, then its clients spend more in the community, the other banks accumulate notes drawing on that bank, and it runs out of reserves. So there were strict limits on credit expansion from any one bank in that kind of a system. Central banks, their function, what's one of the things, if you go look at the historical controversy or discussion, one of the functions of the central bank was to be a lender of last resort. So that is not at all telling private banks, hey, don't lend too much, don't be too aggressive in your loan policies if we're here to bail you out if you get caught with your pants down. That's what you need a lender of last resort for, is if you get caught and people, you owe people more money than you can pay them at the moment, that's when the central bank comes in to, to rescue you. So that institution, far from promoting conservatism among commercial banks, actually gives them the incentive to inflate more. And then also, obviously, tight regulation restricting free entry of new firms into the banking sector allows a cartel to form, right? Because even if all the banks, you know, remember that mechanism I said two minutes ago, what if all the commercial banks agree with each other, hey, let's just all inflate in unison so our notes, you know, cancel out each other and we can all make more loans and earn, earn more interest income and then we won't have a net drain of reserves because we're all doing it together. They might do that, but then some new bank can set up shop that has a higher reserve ratio and it will drain the reserves from all the expanding banks. But you can't do that if it's really hard to open up a new bank. And it, right now, it's very difficult to, you can't just open up a new bank. It's not like opening up a pizza shop, okay? And so notice again, all the things that are in place allegedly to protect the public actually protect the, the banking sector and allow them to inflate more. Okay, the famous question, who would build the roads? I, I always forget to look up. Tom Woods has my favorite quick one-liner response to this. He says something like that, yeah, it's kind of amazing that this is the go-to objection to libertarianism. It's like there's consumers over here and there's Walmart over here and they can't figure out how to, you know, they're all just scratching their heads saying, how can we get together? And, right? and, and notice, it's, it's not like it takes some secret knowledge to know how to build a road. You see what I mean? Like it's, whereas you could see with things like uh, you know, we'll get into this on the Friday talk if you go to that one where I talk about military defense. You can kind of understand someone thinking, well, gee, the NSA and the FBI and the CIA, they know things that the private sector doesn't know, and so that's why they need to be in charge of keeping us safe from the Russians or whoever. But when it comes to building roads, it's not like, yeah, the government or the political authorities know certain things about asphalt that nobody in the private sector knows. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? All right. Okay. Also, besides just the theoretical appeals I'm making, historically, again, we see the same pattern. The early turnpikes, they were raised, constructed privately. There was, and there were, there were mechanisms, too, to overcome what you could call the free rider problem. So if there were a bunch of merchants in a certain area, they knew if they built a turnpike that went through there that they could attract you know, traffic from, you know, so like p people are going from here, like this major city to this major city, and let's say there's a town in the middle, they would know if we make it convenient for these people to go right through our town this way, then we'll benefit from them stopping and buying stuff along the way from us rather than stopping somewhere else. And so the, the merchants in an area might all chip in to help contribute and build a road where they're not stopping people every two feet and charging a toll. They could have free access roads like that where the local merchants are the ones putting up the money because they know it will more than pay for itself and the extra traffic they're going to get. All right, And there were like public shaming campaigns and things in certain areas where you know somebody who was the advocate of building this privately financed turnpike would get contributions from the major merchants and then if somebody was holding out 
you know, he might publicly let people know that, hey, this one guy is going to benefit from this and he's not. So they couldn't stick a gun to his head. But the point was there were plenty of mechanisms to try to get financing for so-called public goods short of sticking guns in people's faces, all right? And this did work historically, and it was only later that governments took it over. Okay, on this issue, some people say, oh my gosh, if this were the case, I mean, in some cities, red lights would mean go and green lights would mean stop, and it would just be complete anarchy and chaos. <laughs> okay, so number one, obviously that's silly, okay? Like, it's not that we have different definitions of what a centimeter is around the world, and yet it's not that if you try, you know, some scientist try to publish a paper and they have a footnote saying, by the way, when we say centimeter, we mean, and they said some huge unit of length, you know, they just wouldn't get published. That'd be crazy, all right? So it's not that you need force to make sure that there are standards that people voluntarily embrace. On the other hand, it's good that in certain settings there would be some variety and some experimentation. And so if you've never heard of this guy, later go Google Hans Monderman. So he, I think he's Dutch. He's a, a road engineer. And he has what at the time were very unorthodox views. So he doesn't believe in signage or lights. And in, in, in his mind, if, if you have to put up a light or a sign to regulate the traffic flow, you built the road wrong. That it, it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to give that extra information. Just the natural design and layout of the road should give the drivers what they need. And he was a big proponent of traffic circles. And you know, the drivers would go up to there and they would be confused and not know what to do. And he said, exactly, that's what you want. You don't want people zoning out and just not paying attention because, oh, it's all right. If there's a red light, I'll stop. Otherwise, I'm not even paying attention to what I'm doing. He said, that's how you hit pedestrians, as if you're not really paying attention. And instead, if you're a little bit confused as a driver, you're looking around, you're alert, you're not going to hit somebody. And he did this thing. I can't find it on YouTube now, but I did see it. He's talking to a reporter, explaining his views. He goes up to an intersection that he designed. It's like a, tra a traffic circle, and it's crazy. There's cars all over the place. He turns around, yeah, backwards. And he, and he starts walking backwards across the street into the traffic, right? So he was hit and killed, but still the point, <laughs> no, no, he didn't get hit and killed. So his point was he was showing how much he trusted his design that he knew the oncoming motorists were very alert and they're not going to run into a guy. Okay, so again, I'm, just, I'm not saying that's necessarily the solution, but my point is we just assume that the way the state builds and maintains roads now is the way it ought to be done. When no, it's a cliche about how in many areas there's potholes in the roads and it's terrible. So the, the, who, you know, who knows what it would look like, but don't just assume the way that the state maintains the road network right now is the correct way and it's up to the market to prove it can maybe match the performance of the state. Why would you think that? Okay, well, Walter Block makes the point. If you look at the, the fatalities, it's not as if there's two people every year who die on the roads, right? There's lots of fatalities and his point is, if a private company were causing all these, there'd be congressional hearings. And yet the way it is now, if people die, it's just, oh, well, yeah, driver error. The guy must have been drinking or he was going too fast or get his brakes checked. People don't stop and say, gee, maybe we shouldn't have the political system be in charge of designing and, and building and maintaining the roads. Maybe that's why there's so many deaths at this intersection. Okay, beyond all that stuff, this simple phenomenon of traffic jams, all right? So if you're not from a big area, this might not be a huge deal to you, but if you like are, are in New York, LA, Chicago, Houston, it is crazy just how much time people waste every day rush hour going to and from work in the city. And these are very productive people. That time is very valuable. So I don't, I don't have the estimates at my fingertips, but I'm thinking it's like in the billions of dollars in terms of just lost productivity, these high productive people sitting in traffic. Beyond that, I do think the murder rate in New York would go down if you privatize the roads because people, how aggravated they get. And I'm losing it! And they just, you know, go. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even kidding. I'm, I'm being serious. All right. So also, something like Bridgegate, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but Chris Christie got in trouble. He's governor of New Jersey. And there were serious allegations. I don't know if they like, literally proved it happened, but there were very serious allegations that some of his key staffers to punish some mayor, some Democratic mayor who hadn't supported Christie's re-election campaign as governor, deliberately shut down some, some roads, I think it was the George Washington Bridge on the top, deliberately shut them down during rush hour one time to punish that mayor, to cause massive traffic snarls. And then there was some, like, some, I think somebody died because he was in the, in the ambulance or something. And, and so that was a huge scandal, and people say that's partly why maybe Christie didn't get picked as Trump's VP because of that reason. But the point being, if, if we were 
from scratch debating whether the political system or the profit and loss system should build and maintain roads. And I said, well, you don't want to trust the political system because maybe just out of personal vendetta, they might deliberately cause huge traffic jams that inconvenience thousands of people. I'm sure the critic will be like, oh, yeah, I'm sure somebody would do that. Jeez, you know. Whereas, no, that literally happened, apparently. Okay, so you see, and why not? The only reason that it was bad for them is they got caught. It's not that you know, they, they lost out on the, on the, you know, that the officials who made that call were thousands of dollars poorer because they had fewer people passing the toll that day, right? You could say the, the, the political authorities missed out on the revenue, but so what? The people who made that decision do not directly get to pocket that revenue. That's not their money. It would be corruption if they pocket, whereas a private company is not going to, out of a vendetta, just implement some policy because they hate some guy across the street and lose thousands of dollars, or at least they will personally feel that. They would have to really hate the guy to do that. They're like, if you're willing to pay it, okay. Asset forfeitures. There's a huge thing now where governments, um, the, like the police, this was a big thing. Uh, I can't remember which interstate it was, but there's an interstate that went through Nashville where the, the, the deal is people would bring in money in the cars, buy drugs, and then go the other way um, with, with the drugs. And the police set up roadblocks to, allegedly to stop this trafficking but coincidentally, they set it up on the side where the money was coming in. They weren't trying to catch the people with the drugs. They were stopping people who had cash in their, in their trunks, seizing it. And there are horror stories where like, people who don't trust banks or some guy was in the middle of something and he was moving and he had you know, thousands of dollars, like $80,000 in cash in his trunk because he was going to go buy a house. And just, he was, you know, not a person, for some reason, he didn't trust the commercial banks. What a nut job. And you know, there was, it wasn't like... You know, he had a bunch of white powder in the back seat or something. He's like, say hello to my little friend. No, he, he's just a regular guy, and he had a bunch of cash, and the cops thought, well, that's suspicious, and they took it, and he has to prove he's not a drug dealer to get his cash back, right? So there's all sorts of things like that. That wouldn't be able to occur. I mean, the reason the state can get away with that kind of stuff is cause, because they own and control the roads. That's partly why they have such dumb. So, it's, again, it's not merely an issue of, traffic jams. Oh, by the way, I didn't explain. The reason traffic jams occur is because the price is too low. That's just a standard shortage. Just think about a supply and demand graph. What happens if the price is too low? Too many people want to use the resource compared to the quantity supplied. That's a shortage. That's what traffic jams are. They're shortages. Okay. So the price is too low. If it were privatized, the price, the, the tolls would initially shoot through the roof, but at least rush hour would be you know, fast. And then with those huge profits, people would build more roads and, and tunnels and bridges and so forth. Okay, the last thing, involuntary blood draws. There's another thing now, too, where at DUI checkpoints or whatever, they will, against your will, like hold you down and pull blood out and test it. Again, the, and people worry, you know, that went to the Supreme Court and things, but that's the reason that happens is because the government's the one in charge of the roads, right? If it were a, mark, a private company in charge of these roads here and another company on these roads here, if you didn't like their policy, you would just drive on the competitor's roads. Whereas, you know, if it's the local government doing it, you can't, it's... It's harder just to say, I'm not going to go to Albuquerque anymore. Whereas you could easily say, I'm not taking Route A, I'm taking Route B that this company maintains. Okay, what about public, so-called public transportation? Again, if, you've, if you live in a big city or have lived there, you're going to know exactly what I mean. If you haven't, this might not make sense to you. But this is basically what the subway looks like in New York City at certain times of day. Uh, and so what they will do, I mean, literally, the, the subway comes in, it opens, if it's like 4 through 6 p.m. in certain areas where a lot of office workers are going home for the, the subway opens, shh, people literally go in, and I'm talking about like in terms of there's not much volume left inside the subway car that's not human flesh. I'm being serious. And so, but notice that doesn't happen on airplanes, right? It's not like you get into the plane and, and some guy's sitting on your lap and somebody's on your shoulders. And they're, you're saying, okay, well, we're going to Tokyo now. We strap in. <laughs> and you say, why is this? Oh, because it's a popular. You should have known. You should have flown at 3 a.m. That's, that's the solution. They don't do that. Or a, a movie theater opening, right? You go to, like, the opening of the new Avengers movie or something. It might sell out, but the theater owner doesn't let everyone pile in and sit on you to go watch Captain America, right? Because they, I mean, this is silly. Like I said, because they know we want our customers to have an enjoyable experience. What you do is you raise the price or you build more capacity. You don't just let anybody pile in so that the thing, so that the, 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 the rationing mechanism is to make the good or service less enjoyable to the user. That's not what a private business does, but the state does that because they don't care. The people run the subway, whether they make more or less profit, those bureaucrats don't earn bonuses 
for earning a profit. Again, if, if they got caught doing it, that would be embezzlement. If they said, oh, we, we raised tolls and we, we limited, you know, we put in turnstiles and strictly enforced them and we had police to make sure people weren't going in beyond just the seating capacity in the standard standing room. And then, you know, and we raised the prices to be able to accommodate that and we made an extra billion dollars last quarter and now we're going to give ourselves bonuses of 100 million each for this new plan. You know, people would flip out. They'd say, what are you doing? You're charging us more money and pocketing it. That'd be corruption. And so that's why the political system doesn't do that. And you end up with craziness like this. All right, what about free and compulsory schooling? Okay, so government schools are often a euphemism for prison in some communities. And here, I mean, so I don't just mean like, oh, I'm miserable, I don't want to have to learn algebra. I mean, in some areas, like literally you are in physical danger if, if the kids that have to go to certain schools. And again, it's, it's, not, it's precisely the groups of people that interventionists say would be left behind and not taken care of in a free market. And that's why we need to have free so-called public schooling is because of these underserved communities that you know, the rich capitalists would ignore. It's precisely those people who are getting terrible educations and are often in literal physical uh, violence situations because of this. They can't even not go to school because it's against the law. Also, it's not a coincidence, I would say. Right? It's not just, oh yeah, the, the people running the, the state apparatus mean well and they just haven't paid attention. To the, what, they weren't aware that there's shootings and knifings in schools and so forth and the test scores are pretty poor. No, they know full well. So I think the real reason in terms of long term, why is it the state insists on having such a strong presence in education is for the reason I said in the beginning that the people running this know full well how much ideas matter and ideology is important and this is how you maintain, for example, that U.S. history is nothing but a succession of which president will happen to be in office for that four years. Okay, and so homeschooling, other non-traditional approaches vastly outperform these establishment ones. And also, let me just mention, um, the, well, I think there's like about half, the, let's say half the people who are currently in college shouldn't be. And I don't mean because they're stupid. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's a certain type of person. Like when I, when I first was teaching, I could just tell that in the class, half of the students, I would say, they really, it's, it's, they, just, they were there because they had to, because they knew, oh yeah, I have to get a college degree to get a job. You got to do this. And it was really just four years of checking the box. Whereas let's say the other half were actually interested in the ideas. And again, I'm not saying the one group was smarter than the other. In, in many cases, there were plenty of really intelligent people who I thought this is such a waste for them to be sitting here watching me draw marginal cost curves. They're not going to ever use this stuff. They should go out and you know, get more business experience right away. They're wasting four years here. Not only are they spending money, but they're missing out on potential job experience. All right. So the, the way I try to get regular people to see this point is I go the other way. And I say, what if we change the, the expectations so that everybody to get a job to be considered a normal citizen and to have good loving parents had to go get a PhD in something, right? We could see how that would be crazy. You say, no, that would, that would just water down what a PhD meant if everybody, if the standard rule was any educated person had to have a PhD in something, you would realize they'd have to lower the standards in those programs and it would just be an arms race. If everybody has to get a PhD, then that doesn't signify anything. And so it's just now instead of having to have a bachelor's degree, you have to have a PhD. It would cancel out largely. And it would just, we would all lose four or five more years of our life rather than being productive. Okay. And so you can see how that would be kind of crazy. So I'm saying, what are the chances right now we're at the optimal position? And whereas we admit insisting on more schooling would be a problem, no, maybe dialing it back actually would make more sense. And it's clearly with all the government support given to education in terms of subsidies and mandates and so forth, you can see how it's pushing people well beyond whatever that optimal level would be. Okay, what about safety regulation? I'm going to speed up here because I've got a couple more topics I want to hit. Whenever there's a foodborne illness or a plane crash, even though the state apparatus is officially in charge of keeping that stuff safe, safe for us to make sure those wildcat free enterprise nut jobs don't run the show and have shoddy products and adulterated food and so forth and crazy planes where there's no oil changes. That's what we have the FAA for, the FDA. Da, da, da. So whenever people die, whenever there's disaster under the state's regulation, why people don't say, huh, maybe the state's doing a bad job. No, it's always... Thank goodness we had the you know, FAA there. We need to beef up their funding when there's a plane crash. Right? That's, that's weird. It's like what could possibly happen to make people 
doubt the current system. They always look at the failures under interventionism and say, that's what would happen under the free market, except more so, which is just weird if you think about it. Okay, so just look at the comparative institutional analysis. When there's a plane crash, the FAA typically will get more funding. If there's some particularly agree, like if some inspector got caught being drunk and he didn't go look at the planes, he might get fired or something. But it's not that the program is going to get its budget slashed because you're doing a bad job. They're going to get more funding. If you're in Congress and there's a bad plane crash and you vote to cut the funding of the FAA, you know, that'd be crazy. People would go nuts. What are you doing? They need more money. So that's weird where if they fail, they get more money. So why would we expect them to, to do well in that scenario? Also, I don't have time to get into it here, but the standard libertarian critique of the FDA is that they have all these unnecessary regulations and insistence on uh, test procedures and so forth to bring a new drug to market, such that right now it costs over a billion, billion with a B, dollars to bring a major new drug to market. So that's true. And so that's partly why those drugs are so expensive because they have to be, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. And that's why you have drugs developed for mass markets, not for real niche illnesses, because it just they, they don't, can't make money off of it. That's all true, but the flip side is also true, that the FDA approves stuff that is actually uh, so dangerous that it shouldn't be used under any standard metric of you know, risk-reward, and yet the FDA is very reluctant and sluggish in admitting it made a mistake and yanking the thing from the uh, shelves, and because the FDA approved it, that sort of gives its blessing and makes people more likely to use the thing than if you just had a total free market. So here, it's not that consumers on their own would have to go and do tests on pills. There would be private certification agencies. Right now, there are magazines, like there's Best Pills, Worst Pills, I think it's a subscription service. They, um, this was true as of a, like about five years ago or so when I was doing research for a book. That magazine correctly anticipated all of the recalls the FDA would do months or in some cases years before the FDA reversed itself. So let me just restate that. This magazine that was giving consumers feedback and insight into which pharmaceuticals were safe or not was saying these particular uh, items the FDA has approved, we think they're not safe, we think the FDA will reverse itself eventually, and it, it was correct in, in all of those cases. And in many cases it took years for the FDA to, to admit it had been wrong. In particular, go look up the Vioxx scandal just to see you know, the most egregious case. Okay, what about vaccinations? So again, here, pr private schools and so forth, they can have whatever rules they want. A private school can say, to attend here, you need to show us you have these vaccinations. That's, you know, under free society, they're fine to do that. They're, they're free to do that. Other schools can say the opposite. They can say, you know what, we don't insist on this. We're, so it's the point is you don't need a pol the political system to enforce it. It's not that regulation or standards necessarily has to flow from the coercive political process. Also, this is an ironic area because by its very nature, if you're saying, no, my kid's vaccinated, then in general that your kid should be free, you know, should be safe from these illnesses, right? So it's, it's odd that this is one where a lot of, it's a hill a lot of people die on and say, yeah, yeah, I like the libertarian view, but no, I mean, come on, we have to have mandatory vaccinations. And the counter response to this is interesting. So I was in an argument with somebody, you know, I was saying, I don't think the state should enforce vaccination policies, let the schools and, you know, workplaces come up with their own policies. And, uh, and, the, and, I, and I made that, that second point. And I said, and by the way, if you like the vaccines and think they're good, then just, okay, give them to yourself and to your kids, and then you'll be safe from this stuff, right? And he said, well, no, that's not enough. We need to have what's called herd immunity. We have to have it so that most people get it because there are people who, because of their, you know, frail system or whatever, if they got the vaccination, it could be deadly to them. And so since they can't get vaccinated, we need to enforce just about everybody else gets the vaccination so that we can't have an outbreak. And so notice, though, they're admitting it went from these vaccinations are totally safe and only Jenny McCarthy and other nut jobs could possibly not want to give their kid this stuff to, well, some people might die if we gave them the vaccine, so that's why everyone else has to be forced to do it. And so now we're just quibbling over who is it safe to give it to or not? It's gone from this blanket science versus tinfoil hat wearing nut jobs to we're disagreeing. The political authorities say this group it's safe to administer to, and some parents disagree with that judgment. So now you can see that this is really a very nuanced thing, and clearly I would you know, give the prerogative to the parents. Okay, the last thing, I got 30 seconds here. I'm going to solve the immigration problem. You ready? <laughs> okay, so first of all, 
as with things like prayer in schools, so, hey, do you think that in the government schools there should be prayer, you know, can, and, or the Ten Commandments? There's no good answer to that. The people on both sides have legitimate points. So same thing with immigration. With the authorities in Washington enforcing national borders, yes, both sides make valid points, and there's no ultimate solution. So it's, it's, it, you're not going to have – that's part of the problem. That's why you don't want to have the political authorities mandating uh, a one-size-fits-all solution. Okay, let me just mention, though, there's no such thing as a right to travel freely. Okay, when it comes to things like malls, fancy restaurants, country clubs, or your own house, of course you can enforce borders. You're not, you know, restricting someone's freedom. But there's no freedom to travel through this region unmolested by any sort of intervention. That, that's not true. There's no such thing as the right to move around, the right to migrate. So ultimately, in a free society, private landowners would set whatever policies they want. So let me just demonstrate... I'm going to solve this with PowerPoint. It would look something like this, okay? So we're worried. Imagine the, the current continental U.S. goes Rothbardian next Thursday. This is the way it would look. Conveniently, only people with very short first names bought these parcels of land. <laughs> now, now the, and so they set whatever policies they want, okay? Now, the problem is you say, what, what about Pam? Pam is kind of crazy. She's a big fan of MS-13 and ISIS, and so she is not going to, do much about this border right there. So that's why we need to have, you know, Washington, D.C. come and put troops and build a fence. Watch this, you guys. Ready? Bam! <laughs> the people around Pam can enforce it, okay? And so the, the point being that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard problem. I'm actually, I'm not, I mean, I'm being glib here. Obviously, it's a hard problem, but the point being that as with everywhere else, just private, private, that's really the only solution. So yes, we can quibble and say, okay, given that this isn't going to happen next Thursday, what should the U.S. federal government, I get that, but my point is there's going to be no good satisfactory answer there. Whatever we say is going to be inferior compared to legitimate private property where people enforcing the borders on their own land. Okay, I am done here, so thanks everybody. <laughs> <laughs>